Welcome to a new episode of the Let's Turn the Tide podcast by Veolia Near and Middle East. I'm your host, Nadine Zidani, sustainability expert and founder of Mina Impact. Today's topic is hazardous waste management, and we are lucky to have with us an expert in this field with over 25 years of experience. Our guest is Sylvain Vacker, business development manager at Veolia Middle East. Sylvain, welcome to the Let's Turn the Tide podcast. Thank you, Nadine. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? Very good, you? Very well, thank you. I'm very curious about today's topic because I know very little about hazardous waste. So my first question is very simple. What is hazardous waste? Hazardous waste, so in a simple way, we can describe this as a, let's say, a product that can be harmful to people or environment due to its nature, chemical, physical, biological nature. So basically something that can be toxic for human health or mm -hmm. toxic and toxic for the environment. Okay, so it's interesting because whenever I, you know, see the word hazardous waste, my first thought goes to uh, uh, industries because they have to deal with uh, dangerous items. So, uh, but as citizens, you know, as normal people, do we generate or do we uh, create hazardous waste? Yes, we do. I mean, like industry, industry generates a small fraction of the total production as hazardous waste. And we as citizens are using, the, let's say, the product produced by the industry at a lower level, but at our level, we are basically generating hazardous or wa hazardous waste. So one of the simple examples will be paint. Paint is a easy chemical product that is, if it's not, let's say, contained and sent to the right uh, disposal route, can be harmful for the environment. Other are more like uh, typical one that we use in the house, like bleach, cooking oil, washing powder, all those things. Medicines is a simple one also. Expired medicines are all those products that if it's not contained and sent to the right route can be harmful. Interesting. Cooking oil. I didn't know that. Yeah, cooking oil. Uh, yes, cooking oil, because cooking oil, what do you do? I mean, typically, when I ask a question around, people just send it to the sink. But why sending cooking oil to the sink? If you send it to the sink, basically, potentially, you are going to plug the pipes. And once it will reach a biological treatment station, it will create issues in the bio biological treatment. Taking one other example that you mentioned, paints. Yes. What is the risk of not disposing of uh, paints uh, properly? And what, what could happen? I would say the first risk, if we go step by step, mm -hmm. is when we are using the paints. We should carefully read what is written on the, let's say, I'll call it sticker, but we need to read it. You have two types of paints, uh, solvent base and the water base. The so solvent base is basically, uh, let's say, oil derivative base. So basically, it has a, it's as harmful as any gasoline or chemicals product. So this is a solvent base. And the most challenging for us is to breathe those solvent paints because they contain potentially harmful chemicals. Then, so that's the first thing is when you use it, you need mm -hmm. to be careful. Secondly, to dispose it, before disposing it, you will understand that, yeah, first of all, to clean the tools, you need the same solvent. So that's another exposure. And then what do you do with the solvent that is contaminated? If you send it to the sink, then potentially you are going to damage, your, let's say, the downstream, basically the biological treatment that comes after. So one, this is one type that we see less and less, but still, because people that it has some specific properties that people like to use it. And then there is a water base that is easier to use, but can be so more, I mean, could have a bigger impact because it's so easy that once you finish, you just wash it with water. So you open the tap, <laughs> you clean everything, but uh, nothing is prepared for it. It's, it's not supposed to. And we are living like, for example, we're in Dubai, so we are almost 3 million habitants. 
if it's tomorrow only 1% of the population start doing painting, you can imagine that the wastewater treatment plant is not ready for it. It will not treat it properly. So basically, this will be released to the atmosphere at the end. I think we underestimate our exposure to hazardous waste, and we are completely unprepared to um, deal with it, you know, as, as citizens, like something as normal as paint. The industry is slightly better prepared, mm -hmm. but I would say just slightly, because basically when the industry released, as I mentioned earlier, less than 1% of the total production as waste, we do release less than 1% of our total waste, one, less than 1% is hazardous waste, more, I mean, it's very small fraction. What makes it quite a significant impact is the multiplying factors. Uh, this is where the impacts come from. Talking about industries, um, we're in the Middle East. Yes. So um, can you give us a view of, you know, the industries that generate the most hazardous waste? So, yeah, so we are in the Middle East, so we are in the middle of the oil and gas industry, so for sure, oil and gas is the main hazardous waste generator, uh, followed by the aluminium, because mm -hmm. Middle East is also a massive producer of aluminium. Steel also, so all the steel mill, those are the big free industries that generate a lot of, I mean, massive quantities. Most of them are potentially recyclable, so we'll come to it. Then it will be followed by food and bev. So f when I say food and bev, let's start with food and let's start with uh, agriculture. So basically, it, we have a various agriculture, specifically a bit more, I mean, in GCC. So agriculture that is going to use a lot of water, insecticide, pesticide. So those can have an impact. Then there is everything that is farms. You have farms that have 30,000 cows in one farm. So basically, we are accumulating such massive quantity of animals at the same place that potentially things must be treated properly, or else it will release hazardous waste too. And then there is a processing of the food and beef industry. So meat, slaughteries, ovus, diaries, and, and so on. Farms, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised. <laughs> yes, the biggest, the biggest farm in the world are in Saudi, around Riyadh, yeah. You have farms of 30,000 cows, okay. a line, in a straight line. But can you make the link with hazardous waste? Because it's not that natural for me. When you have all those concentration mm -hmm. of farms, you, you need to be, I mean, you, you need to feed them. You need to treat the atmosphere, you need to treats whatever it's released mm -hmm. from those farms. And I will call it the end of life of those cows. If you don't do it properly, mm -hmm. you are going to, are, it's releasing hazardous waste or it's releasing waste that are harmful for the environment. Okay, oh wow. That's, that expands actually the spectrum of what we think is hazardous waste. Now, if we focus, as you said, one of the main industries, oil and gas. So can you explain us at Veolia, how do you treat uh, hazardous waste coming from oil and gas industry? And you know what happens after what happens after the after the treatments? Uh, so oil and gas, I mean, without entering into too many, let's say, technical mm -hmm. aspects, I mean, we usually divide it in two parts, the upstream and the downstream activities. But in any case, whatever waste is generating is waste that contains oil. So the first thing that is done at value level is to separate the oil from the rest and to recycle as much as possible oil to basically send it back to the oil producer. Yes, yeah, the natural cycle is whatever can be recycled uh -huh. goes back to the industry that generated. Okay. And treating what is left is basically neutralizing, as you said, so yes. it's not harmful for the environment nor people. Yeah, the, the full purpose of the treatment uh -huh. is to, ne oh yeah, in simple words, let's say neutralizing. Okay. You've been in this field for many years now. Yes. What, what are the main challenges that you're still facing? If I can make a parallel with what we discussed for our day-to-day -day life for a, all of us being aware of it yeah. is awareness and uh, even if I, well, 
is awareness, that's the first thing, but the second thing is regulation. No regulation, no treatment of hazardous waste. Mm -hmm. In a, to make it a, a parallel is uh, driving on the highway, speed limit. Uh, when I came to Middle East was 13 years ago. Come to Dubai, everyone, everyone is more or less respecting the speed limit, but you will understand because on Sheikh Zayed you get a, a speed controller every kilometer. Going Saudi, yes, the signs are here. So it's not only about, ah, oh, yes, I have a regulation. The speed is limited to 120. Is you need to have a regulator. Mm. So someone that can apply, it, like the police, fine. So you need to have this regulator body that is going to be here to make sh to be the referee mm -hmm. and to make sure that yes you change things you must this you exceed you exceed the speed limit so you'll get a fine so from now is either you respect the rules or you get a fine it does work in some country of GCC everywhere in the world where there is hazardous waste treatment is because there is a regulation and a regulator. In GCC today, this is driven by Saudi and UAE. So Saudi and UAE are two countries where you have regulation and regulators. The rest today, they have regulation, not yet regulators. Coming back to what you said about awareness. So, I mean, if we have regulations, we have like the rules basically, I would say, are in place. Um, when it comes to awareness, what's, what's blocking, especially industries, to... Um, to take action? Uh, it's, I would say it's a bit like any of us. What will make that tomorrow, your what is left in your paint pot will not go to the mm -hmm. trash and you will make sure that you'll find a way to dispose it or to give it to someone. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a bit, uh, I mean, today is a bit of chicken and the eggs. Do you have a facility or let's say a failure that is in place to make sure that the ad hoc treatment will be in uh, put in place will be and, 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 and it will be done. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. After awareness, so, so that's the first thing. The second one is uh, why should I bother myself if I don't have any facilities? What will make the difference? Mm -hmm. Now, when we go to industry, uh, it's a bit different because in some country you have this, uh, the polluter is the one that will pay in any case. And we have long history. I mean, there's a long history about industry that in the past did pollute and today must pay. They hold the accountability yes. of, you know, whatever, you know, hazardous waste they generate and how they dispose of it. Yeah, to some extent, I would say it's easier to mm -hmm. find a big chemical player, big oil and gas, a big industry players. Mm -hmm. If you, me, drop through pot of paint in the trash, maybe no, I mean, no one will notice it. Mm -hmm. But it will have an impact. Mm -hmm. And we need to think about the accumulation. So it's you and me plus, you know, some small businesses and yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the accumulation factor. A bit yeah. like, I'll, I'll put a simple example, like a plastic in the ocean. Mm -hmm. At one point of time, it does accumulate somewhere. Yeah. And it's when it does accumulate that it becomes harmful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's interesting. So you would say that the how is is still a little bit misunderstood like i see you know i have you know regulations i see the rules but how to take action is still um um not really understood or uh, you don't know where to go yeah but, but there's several steps for the industry it's easier you put the regulation press the regulator uh -huh. and then but the, and and then it, it will move on so someone will build a facility, mm -hmm. someone will treat it, mm -hmm. and it will be taken into action mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, it's their business. Mm -hmm. When it comes to us, let's put all of us in the same pocket, basket, whatever, uh, it's going to be more awareness. 
we need to have more awareness, explain people what is the risk, mm. why there's a risk, why does, yeah, be careful about the paint, be careful about bleach, be careful of whatever mm. chemical, I mean, in pesticide you are using at home or, I don't know, or your, you change, some people change their car oil also in their garage and what do they do with it? And after they need it to light up the barbecue. Mm. So all those things, are uh, at, uh, let's say, micro level insignificant, mm -hmm. but the accumulation of all of it is where things get dangerous. Mm -hmm. Well, it's fascinating, Sylvain, because we talk a lot, for instance, about plastic waste. So there is a lot of awareness, you know, and emphasis put on, on plastic. So people are, you know, it's easy for them to talk about plastic, but less about hazardous waste. So I um, hope that this podcast is going to help, you know, trigger this conversation. Um, when it comes to, so I like what you said about uh, citizens and, and people, you know, like you and me, what would be the practical advice that you can give our audience to carefully disposing of, of a hazardous waste? Uh, well, first of all, I, I, I'll, I'll say read the sticker on anything, mm -hmm. read it. It, it will give you quite some useful and valuable information. Now the next challenge is going to be, okay, so now what do I do? Mm -hmm. Because it does not exist. I mean, a bit like you spoke about plastic. Yet, I mean, yes, we can segregate plastic. Where do we dispose it? Who is going to take care of it? So. I, I think at one point of time, yes, people need to at least train themselves to try to segregate it, to read whatever is written on the sticker, to try to segregate, dispose it at uh, the right place, mm -hmm. and try to see and ask questions to basically the community. What should be done? What can I do with those things? Because we, we spoke about paint, we can add batteries, we can add cooking oil, we can add whatever things that could be recycled, like our clothes. Mm. Our clothes are going to be made of uh, polyester, cotton, polyester, polyamide, whatever. All those are, to some extent, I mean, they are chemical products initially. Mm. So this recycling, let's call it, yes, recycling activity should be taken at almost any single point. I mean, don't take your old T-shirt and put it in the trash. Mm. Make sure that segregate it, give it to the Red Crescent. There is plenty of, I, I saw many disposal area in Dubai for this. So, and it will be recycled. Someone will reuse it. Fashion is, a, is an interesting example too, because indeed it's not, there is no, in our minds, you know, direct connection with uh, hazardous waste. But as you said, yeah, it's, Mostly, you know, based on yeah, look, the nice pink color is not a natural one. Huh? Okay, <laughs> I, I feel bad now. <laughs> <laughs> not sure is the blue is the same. <laughs> <laughs> so, as a as a as an expert in the field, um, um, what do you see as future developments in you know technologies or you know um, processes uh, or regulations? <laughs> several questions in one. Uh, the first thing that needs to move and carry on in the future is, yes, it's regulation and regulator. That's, that's the first thing. And associated to it, the recycling, percentage of recycling needs to increase and will increase. There is no aim in, let's say, neutralize, as we said, hazardous waste in quantity that, are, that could be massive. The first thing is we need to reduce it. And to reduce it, the first step is recycling. So recycling is really the first step. So by collecting the other those waste, segregating, once it's segregating, just let's reassemble it by families. And by families, look at what we can recycle. And once we can really not recycle it, then we move to the step of what I will call uh, on the simple word, neutralization. Sylvain, we end the podcast with the same question to our guests. Uh, what is the one action that we can take to turn the tide? 
as an individual, yes. as an individual, I mean, I don't want to repeat what I said, but please read, read what is written on any bottle, on any pot, J just for you to under try to be curious. Take your T-shirt, look at the composition, and say, hmm, what is your origin? Uh, if it's 100% cotton, so at least you know that this is, I would say, more or less natural. But don't forget that you need a lot of water, a lot of pesticide to produce cotton, so it's not that direct. But be curious. Mm -hmm. Try to see, hmm, this one is coming from where? Uh, maybe I should be a bit more careful. Maybe I should segregate it. L let's see if I start to, just to do by curiosity whatever I put in the trash, I read it, I say, mm, this may not go to the normal trash. Mm -hmm. Let's segregate it just to get a feeling. So be curious and, and, and do your research. I think it's a, it's a very good first, uh, first step to, uh, uh, to take appropriate action. Thanks a lot, uh, Sylvain. Uh, we learned a lot and I learned a lot myself about hazardous waste, thanks to you. Thanks a lot for coming on the Let's Turn the Tide podcast. Thank you, Nadine. Have a great day. Thank you for tuning in until the end. So a uh, big thank you to our guest, Sylvain Vaquer. Don't forget to subscribe to Veolia Near and Middle East YouTube channel and follow Veolia Middle East on all social media platforms. And stay tuned for our upcoming episode.